Additionally, he studied thousands of pages of period publications, letters, and correspondence. He also explored the journals of the pirates, those who interacted with them and their contemporaries. Using all this material, he reconstructed a comprehensive understanding of pirates, their world, and how contemporaries viewed them, often in stark contrast to our modern preconceptions. And he's just told me that he has basically focused on the pirates of the Caribbean in the early 18th century. Zach has written over 3,000 pages in a series of forthcoming historical fictional novels set during the golden age of piracy. Um, they will, they're still in the process of publication, but I certainly will look for them. Um, he also has spent some time on the brigantines. He did a two-week training course, but has volunteered uh, many times to relocate boats and to help with uh, maintenance on the boats as well. He's an actor, and just on the side, he has been doing some studying in Chinese medicine. So please give Zach Nesbitt a warm show back to him. Ahoy! Ahoy! Amas ye scurvy lovers! Avas! Shiver me timber! Ye scallywags! Me buckle, gym lad, are. Or so, we may think, they said. The golden age of piracy. What an era. Just the name evokes images, romantic images. Beaches, windswept palms, turquoise, azure blue waters, waters of the Caribbean, the West Indies, which many of you may be intimately familiar with sailing. The beauty of it all, Spanish gold, chaos amidst this beautiful tranquility. A war for the biggest um, frontier in the history of the world, much bigger than the American Wild West. Two entire continents, and everybody was on the tape, or well, at least the players involved. The great empires of Britain, France, Spain, Holland, true degree Portugal, and some minor others. Of course, to the horrifying and harrowing expense of the native populations of the Americas, as well as the enslaved Africans who came in the millions. The golden age of piracy conjures up images of swaggering, swarthy sailors walking across sun-drenched decks with cannons and sails at their backs, sailing tall ships across this beautiful ocean and these pristine and exotic locations for treasure, for booty, for plunder. But where does the myth end and the truth begin? Many of our images and preconceptions that we have about pirates are, if not entirely fictional and inaccurate, a great exaggeration of the truth of this age and who these people really were. Over the course of the next hour, we're going to take a look at our modern preconceptions about piracy and who these people were, and gradually dig through the stereotypes to uncover the truth of an age which is vastly misunderstood and had a much greater impact on the world, taking center stage uh, at a time where what was happening was truly revolutionary. And we will follow with a, uh, a short, or brief, as needed, Q&A session. So, the golden age of piracy. Well, what is the golden age of piracy? The question. Now, pirates, of course, have existed, arguably, ever since humanity first found a log. And one caveman hopped on the log and started paddling along. And uh, another one came up and pushed them off. 
that could be considered piracy. There have been pirates all throughout history, ever since commerce existed on the seas. We know from record that there were Ionian pirates, ancient Greek pirates, Roman pirates, pirates of North Africa, pirates of China, the South China Seas. But where do we get almost 100% of our image of who a pirate is, what a pirate looks like? You see, if I showed you a pirate from the era of Sir Francis Drake, the late 1500s, under Queen Elizabeth, you would say, oh, that's Shakespeare. If I showed you a pirate from almost the American Civil War, the very famous pirate Jean Lafitte, out of New Orleans in America, you would say, oh, well, he looks like a cowboy, or like a, somebody from the American Civil War. Where do we get our image of what a pirate not just looks like, but does? All of the romantic idea of it, the Caribbean, the West Indies, the Spanish gold, everything. Well, it comes from this one particular time period known as the Golden Age of Piracy. That's where we get the bucket boots, the tricorn hat, the coat, the galleons, the cannons, the cutlasses, Spanish gold. This era was an era like no other in pirate history, in history in general. It was an era when the most amount of pirates existed at one time in a concentrated area and had the biggest effect on world commerce. And the most famous pirates people were intimately familiar with, more or less, we've heard their names in shanties, in films, since uh, the dawn of filmmaking. People like Blackbeard, Samuel Bellamy, Black Bart, uh, also known as Bartholomew Roberts, Steve Bonnet, Captain William Kidd, Henry Morgan. They all existed in a very short time period. And um, the time period was, at a broad scale, 1660 to about 1730. But if you really wanted to narrow it down, the time frame was really only 10 years, from 1713 to 1723. Now, why? Why was it all of a sudden this huge boom, unprecedented in history, that never existed before? Well, there were many causes and many factors involved. But we'll go into detail on that in a minute. First, I'd like to give you a history, a brief introduction to the history of piracy in the West Indies and the Caribbean, as we know it. So, ever since uh, the Europeans discovered, quote unquote, the New World, it was. Uh, seen as an unparalleled ground for natural resources. Nobody had laid claim to this land, but when they discovered it, all that they were aware of was a couple little islands and the east tip of Brazil. They thought they had found the East Indies, because that's what Columbus had originally set up to do, was to find a route to Cafe over the water, also known as China so that they could begin importing silks directly to Spain and not have to use the Silk Road or later the tedious and arduous route around the Horn of Africa and all the way up to um, the East Indies. So Columbus set out to find China. He found these islands, which we now know as the Bahamas, and assumed that he had reached the East Indies, so he called them the Indies, Las Indias. And um, Vasco da Gama later, not too much later, discovered um, for Portugal, Brazil. So the Pope at the time drew a line through the earth at a, a specific longitude and said, everything discovered, newly discovered to the west of this line belongs by divine right to Spain. Everything discovered to the east, new discovered to the east of this line belongs to Portugal. Spain and Portugal were, at that time, um, very much directly connected with uh, the, uh, the Papal States, which all formed one sort of similar conglomerate empire. So they were the militaristic uh, and mercantile arms of the Church. So, with that, several dozen years of discovery followed. And they realized that they had not just happened upon a couple islands that could have been the Philippines, or even a large island. They had discovered two entire continents, so that changed things. 
But Spain somehow held it as their best kept secret. Of course, the rest of Europe was aware of this discovery, but news traveled much slower back then, so it was much more hearsay. And in the meantime, Spain set about colonizing as much as they could of the New World, using it as their cash cow to fuel their economy and also their ever-expanding uh, empire and wars. Now, at this time, Spain was the world power. It had taken that role from Italy during the late Renaissance and had amassed so much wealth and so much power that it was a force to be reckoned with. It was not Britannia that ruled the waves. In the 1500s, it was Spain. Spain, at the height of its empire, around about the middle of the 1500s, owned, or claimed at least, one quarter of the globe. It was to the point where Britain was in the early 1900s before World War I. Spain, with this vast empire, had extraordinary amounts of resources that were constantly being shipped back to old Spain. Uh, the ones that came from the New World uh, came in massive <coughs> galleons, these beautiful tall ships with sort of banana-shaped hulls, some of them 100 guns apiece, uh, with lofty sails up to 100 feet high, taking crews of up to 1,000 men, uh, working months on end uh, tirelessly to bring the riches of both what was now being termed the West Indies and the New World, and also exports coming from the Philippines and the Orient, um, porcelain, fine china, silks that were being shipped across the Pacific to uh, Alcapulco and then by mule train across to Veracruz in Mexico. They would rendezvous with ships, treasure ships from South America that had mined emeralds the size of one's fist on average in Muso uh, or silver in Potosi in, uh, in what is now I think Bolivia as well as gold from Mexico, rubies from Burma, and uh, diamonds from Suriname. They would all come to Havana and sail home to Old Spain. Once a year, this was called the La Flota, the treasure fleet. And um, England, France, and Spain, or sorry, England, France, and Holland quickly got wind of this and thought, well, this seems like a perfect opportunity for us. So. Queen Elizabeth commissioned, at, in the grand tradition of um, outsourcing, Queen Elizabeth commissioned pirates with a license. They were called privateers. They were private hired uh, captains, often merchant captains, people who had skill at sea, and um, their crews, who had skill fighting, to uh, take their vessels and attack enemy shipping. In this case, it was the gold of Spain. So, people like Francis Drake, Sir Walter Raleigh, Thomas Antis, they spread west from England and headed to the, uh, the Great Spanish Lake and began to pillage and plunder the treasure coming home from Spain. The Spanish, of course, viewed them as insidious pirates, English infidels who were out to challenge Spain's divine right to owning well, one quarter of the world. And, uh, <coughs> They were lauded as demons, pirates, and enemies of humanity back home in England. Sir Francis Drake was knighted. Sir Walter Raleigh was consort to Queen Elizabeth. They were national heroes. They were given such credits and status and land that um, we wouldn't consider them uh, how we normally view pirates. So, this very special breed of pirates, early pirates in the Caribbean, were called the Sea Dogs. And why it's important to understand them is to understand how the political climate gradually changed over the next 100 years, 150 years, and how pirates went from being national heroes to villains, or hostage humanis gratis, enemies of all the time. So, we have the Sea Dogs and their heroic tales of daring do up against all odds, treasure fleets of dozens of ships, and you've got these small, fast, race-built galleons coming in and picking one off, picking another off, and sailing them back to uh, some unpopulated haven and plundering them for all their worth, and then bringing the gold and jewels back to England and sharing them among uh, 
the English royalty, the government, uh, a percentage would always go back to the government from a privateer's commission. That was the point, was that you had a license as a privateer. You went out, you stole goods, um, and then you went home and basically paid a share to whoever had sponsored you. So the sponsors were getting money, uh, the captains were getting money, the crews were getting money, and it was a legal form of piracy. So fast forward a couple decades, early 1600s. The rest of Europe has now got wise that there's a lot going on in the New World. There's a lot of valuable resources and a lot of land that, although claimed by Spain, has not been ceded or colonized whatsoever and is not defended. Now, Spain at this time was, yes, immensely powerful, but they were also an empire in decay. They were crumbling. They were holding on to ways of the past while the rest of Europe was reaching toward the Enlightenment um, scientifically and philosophically and moving in the direction of industrialization. Spain was steadfast in its tradition and its, uh, its ways that did not embrace change, that did not embrace adapting with the new technology in the new time. So, Spain, for a number of other reasons as well, began to crumble and fall apart at the seams. Now, although it had all this land and all these resources, it didn't have necessarily the manpower to police them all. So, Spain was vulnerable and in danger. And with such a widespread vast empire, they could only afford to really well defend, uh, to, to protect well, their vital ports, their treasure ports, um, as well as the convoys. So that meant that all of the other settlements were pretty much left up to their own devices to defend themselves. Uh, and all of the other vessels, sailing for Spain, Spain's merchant fleet, which were not part of the official plate fleet, the treasure fleet, sanctioned by the government, would not be defended by royal escorts. So they would have to, unless under exceptional circumstances, they'd have to defend for themselves. So this left Spain open to attack, vulnerable. And it's at that time when these um, early colonizers from the rest of Europe began snatching up colonies in areas where Spain either hadn't defended as well or they hadn't moved as far north. You see, the Spaniards preferred their native climate, which Andalusia is quite dry, quite hot, go to different parts of Mexico, very familiar to the Spanish. And of course, you know, there are the highlands, um, and they found those in regions like Peru and Bolivia. But they were not accustomed to the northern Europe climates. They were not accustomed to snow or cold, uh, any kind of cold weather, or really surviving too much of a winter that went below freezing. So they, in terms of colonization, pretty much stayed at about the latitude of Florida. They didn't push much further north. This is why, uh, at first the Dutch, then the English, and the French, slowly grabbed colonies in North America. We notice that originally New York was New Amsterdam. Uh, there was New Denmark nearby. Germans came to Pennsylvania much later. The English colonized what became the 13 colonies. Uh, Canada, and then we had um, Nouvelle France here in Canada, as well as you know, out, out east, um, because Spain wasn't really interested in these lands. But there's also a practical reason. The natural resources here weren't considered as valuable as what was being found down south. So this was sort of the backwater of that era, very opposite to our, our modern time. So the focus of the colonization of um, most of Europe was centered around the West Indies. So, in the early 1600s, Britain swept through, along with Holland and France, and captured strategic points, several little islands, one at a time, beginning to gain footholds in the Caribbean. First, Barbados, and then St. Kitts, Antigua, and the Dutch captured Saint Martin, the French, Guadeloupe, Martinique, and they gradually started picking off these less inhabited islands, uh, or things that were merely claimed by Spain, and gaining footholds in, uh, in the New World and gaining their own uh, ability to produce the valued um, resources that this land had to offer. And it was not just the gold and silver 
what was the true lifeblood of the Caribbean and West Indies were trade goods that sold for exorbitant prices when shipped back to European markets. Things like sugar, tobacco, rum, dye woods, indigo. These were all the things that kept the economic wheels of Europe turning. And one could turn an incredibly tidy profit uh, if you had some industry that knew what to do um, when bringing those goods back. So gradually, these different nations were infringing on Spain's design that I to own all of the New World, and Spain did not take kindly to this, of course. Now, there was a saying in that era that even though there may be peace among the European powers, there was no peace beyond the line. What did that mean? That meant that even though there was peace back home, beyond the line that the Pope drew during the Treaty of Tordesillas, it was considered all's fair game. It's the Wild West, but even bigger. There's no real rules out here. If you can take it, it's yours. So, gradually, over the course of the 1600s, um, Britain, France, and Holland made many more campaigns and took over the majority of the West Indian Islands, the larger ones still remaining part of uh, Spain, under Spain's control. Now, we come to the time of the English Civil War. There was pandemonium in England for various reasons, and I won't go into detail on that fully. But um, Cromwell, when he took power over King Charles I, and uh, essentially succeeded the monarchy, had very grand plans of expansion. And where were they centered? The Caribbean. Why? It was the richest place in the world, and the number one place where you could make most bang for the buck. So he wanted, he had designs to take down to Cuba, the largest of the West Indies, the Antilles, um, or Santo Domingo, which we now know as the Dominican Republic. Both attempts failed, and the men who didn't succeed in capturing Cuba or Santo Domingo ended up taking Jamaica. So that became England's major crown jewel, its major colony in the Indies. And Jamaica, over the next 20 years, became a, a sort of um, a land of opportunity. Really, the whole Caribbean, it was true of what was said of America in the early 20th century, was the same of what the Caribbean was in the 1600s. There was so much opportunity to make a life for oneself. If you could come to the West Indies as the majority of people, sorry, I'll go back and explain better. The majority of people who came to the West Indies did not come as free men or free women. Even people of European descent came over in something called indentured servitude. And we know about it uh, from later periods, but really where it started, well, it started in Ireland first, but people would indenture themselves to get over to the New World. They would pay for passage by years of labor. So because it cost nearly the equivalent of two, year, two years wages for a, a farmer, a farmer's wages um, was equivalent to the price of passage to the New World. So how would the commoners afford it? They would indenture themselves to plantation owners upon arrival, that was part of the condition of signing board uh, for the voyage, was upon arrival you would work for a pre-agreed term, usually about four years to eight years time, um, after which point you would be free uh, to do as you wished. Now the reality of the situation was much more grim. The crossing of the Atlantic left um, less than, no, le le um, less than two-thirds of people alive because they weren't accustomed to the diseases that would be rampant and ships would be wracked with in that day and age. Um, so if you survived the arduous six-week crossing, you would make it to the New World and you would find an area that seemed at the same time uh, idyllic, paradise-like, and like the Garden of Eden, but at the same time very foreign. It did not have the chilly English nights. It did not have um, 
the things that they were accustomed to in Europe. It was a very different climate, a different experience, and most people of the time period who were born in Europe did not were not acclimatized to that. So many would die after arrival from diseases that were rampant at the time, yellow fever, smallpox, um, any numbers of forms of malaria, and because medicine at the time wasn't up to par, many would perish. So you're probably wondering why why would they leave this comfortable life and come to the new world? It was because of the opportunity. You see, there was no real social climbing in the 1600s. You were born into a caste, and you would stay there your entire life. The upper echelons of society, the aristocracy, the nobility, the gentry, controlled everything. They had everything, they had all the wealth, and they um, could live their lives idly. They actually spent time trying to figure out how they could entertain themselves, because they had nothing to do. The common man was born into a working life, would work from the time they're earliest time that they're able, sometimes four years old, sometimes three years old, and work to an early death of some time in your 30s or 40s. Now the upper classes would live around 70, 80 years. So there was no getting out of that unless you left for the New World colonies. See, when they came here, it was said that a shoemaker's son with any kind of industry, a little bit of cleverness, and uh, enough staying power could someday, after years of indentured servitude, after he made it out alive, could set up a plantation of his own with the money that he had been given as his quote-unquote freedom dues after being free, uh, could set up a plantation of his own, harvest sugarcane, tobacco, rum, what have you, and within a decade, be the making of his family and his relations back home. What did that mean? He would essentially have the equivalent wealth and some of the power of the highest levels of aristocracy and gentry, owning thousands of acres of rich cultivated land, being able to dress in fine silks and keep a coach and six horses, something that was unimaginable for generations in his family beforehand. So this is why people came to the New World. It was the land of opportunity at the time. So, in the 1660s, this Wild West land, um, known as the Caribbean, had a boom, its first real boom in piracy. Now, it's not necessarily piracy as we know it. Who were these people? Well, they were attacking the Spanish, number one. It's called the Golden Age of Buccaneering. They came before, really, the Golden Age of Piracy, one generation before. Now, this era was marked by rapid expansion, both economically and geographically. And at the time when all of the European powers were having their um, different colonies burgeoning, they needed protection. They didn't have the manpower to send waves and waves of uh, Navy flotillas to the Caribbean. They would just spread them too thin. So what they did is, again, outsourced. They would take the locals, um, the either people who had been born in Europe and come to the New World and had lasted their time and um, were seasoned to the tropical distempers and could live in the climate, or people who were known as Creolians, who were European descent but born in Jamaica, born in Martinique, born in Barbados and uh, known as criollos in Spanish. Um, they would, the governments would come to these people and commission them to not only police the ports and the coastal waters and protect trade, but also to go and attack and plunder enemy trade, to enrich uh, the local economies and hence the economies of the home powers. So this special breed of folk were local hardy sailors who knew the waters. They knew all the best hunting grounds. They knew the places where the prying eyes would look. They knew the hidden coves, the uh, unmarked reefs, the shifting shoals, the tides, like nobody's business. So they became the primary both defense mechanism and also um, opportunity for enrichment for the home powers. 
These were privateers, once again. But they, in this generation, garnered a special nickname, Buccaneers. Now, where did this nickname come from? For that, we need to look at the origins of the French uh, adventurers in the West Indies. France had come to the New World in the early 1600s. They had uh, swept through several islands um, and made civilized ports of places like Martinique and Guadeloupe. Uh, beautiful sugar factories that were sending immense wealth and riches back to, back to France. They also started pushing westwards, and it was in the 1620s when they reached um, what is now Haiti, Haiti, um, and began settling down as cattle ranchers there. Um, these were rough men. Equivalent would be the lumberjacks, or maybe the, uh, the fur traders that we know about here, the, um, the, uh, the, the canoe trippers, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name. Yes, Courtois. Um, they were the southern equivalents of these, these folk. Um, they would live off the land, they would hunt wild cattle and pigs, and uh, gradually they would eke out a living for themselves by selling the tanned hides and the meat back to um, their, their countrymen. The process through which they made the tanned hides and smoked the meat was a very interesting one that they had learned from the Taino Native Americans, who were native and still alive at the time that they arrived in Haiti, um, which was then at one time called the whole the whole island of Haiti in the Dominican Republic was named Hispango, named for uh, Columbus, uh, named it uh, as sort of a, a little Spain when he first discovered it. So, on the island of Hispaniola, you had these cattle hunters, and they learned from the Taino Indians how to smoke and cure the meat and the, the hides. It would be on a lattice work above a fire. This lattice work was called La Lucane, uh, French translation of the, the native name. Um, and the process of smoking the meat was also known as La Lucane. Someone who smoked the meat was a boucanier. That, in the phonetics of the era, was not how we pronounce it today. They called it boucanier, because old French had um, a different, different cadence than phonetics of this today. So, boucanier became buccaneer in English. But how did that get to be associated with piracy, you must ask? Well, the Spanish, of course, not too happy about the French infringing on their, their divine claim, very quickly um, would set about campaigns of burning the crops of all the French inhabitants, destroy, torching their homes, uh, murdering their, their families, their children, um, and killing all the livestock, basically doing everything they could to send them packing, including destroying their main means of um, supporting themselves and their income, which was the pigs and the cows, which the Spanish would kill and uh, leave in a state that the French couldn't harvest them. So, after several decades, the French became so enraged and uh, exacerbated by this, that uh, they, um, they threw down, well, they didn't exactly throw down, they took up their, their knives, their butchering knives, they took up their muskets, and they took to small fishing vessels. And instead of hunting cattle and pig, they hunted Spaniards. <laughs> they thought it was a much more intriguing and enriching prospect to attack which, a nation which at the time was intermittently at war with theirs. They thought that, uh, they saw the great vast streams of wealth flowing out of the, um, the treasure ports and they said, well, we should get some of that for ourselves. And so they did. And the Spanish didn't realize that they had kicked the hornet's nest, as it were. So within several years, the French had grown in such strength that there were something like a fleet of 40 vessels sailing from a port, which many of you may well know from Pirates of the Caribbean films, Tortuga, <laughs> on the north part of the island of Hispaniola is an island that rises out of the sea looking like the back of a turtle, named in Spanish, La Tortuga, named in Spanish, Il de, or in French, Il de Tort. So this was the main port of La Bucanier. The Bucaniers, the French pirates who were only attacking the Spanish at the time, uh, and bringing in much wealth 
Uh, and much to the support of the French colonial powers and uh, home authorities, the French buccaneers joined forces with these English privateers from Jamaica. And together, en masse, they stormed and laid waste to uh, no fewer than 18 of the Spanish treasure ports in a mere seven years. This is not just mere ship-to-ship -ship combat. This isn't a little uh, galleon or a little frigate taking on a big Spanish treasure ship. This is organized militaristic operations on the scale that would be credible for a European home army, much less a band of rabble-rousers, as the Spanish initially perceived them. These men were tough. They lived on the edge of uh, civilization, of the civilized world. They were frontiersmen, really. And just like the Wild West, they knew their weapons. They knew their terrain. They knew their geographical um, situations. So when mounting these large-scale raids, it was not you know, a few miscreants stealing away in the city in the cover of darkness and, and running back out. It was thousands of men and, indeed, some women besieging the strong, the, the greatest strongholds in the Spanish Empire, which was the most powerful empire in the world at the time. They would come over the walls, they would sack the town for all it's worth. The equivalent to millions of dollars in gold, silver, and jewels, plundered in a matter of weeks. And then they would often raise the city, burn it. And the pillage and plunder, or the pillage and um, destruction that followed is quite horrific, but equal in level to what different European nations would dole out to each other during the times of war. So these advanced militaristic operations were backed and funded by both governments of France, Spain, and to a lesser degree Holland. Holland did have a presence in the West Indies, um, several islands, and they would, their, their um, freebooters, or freebooten, in Dutch, would join forces with uh, the French and English to besiege the Spanish treasure ports. So this was a glorious time uh, for piracy in the West Indies, because they were considered heroes of their nation. They were bringing in vast amounts of extraordinary wealth, and recognized for it. Not punished, not penalized, but lauded as heroes, to the point where one of the greatest raids of the era Henry Morgan led 3,000 men marching across the Panamanian jungle to descend upon Panama City on the Pacific coast and lay waste to it, which was uh, Spain's primary treasure port for all the goods coming in from the South American Pacific coast. Uh, he laid waste to the city and burned it, in full knowledge that Spain had a peace treaty with England that had been signed three months before. When he returned to Jamaica, he received a royal summons from King Charles II to come to court at Whitehall. He proceeded aboard his flagship, returned to England, and was knighted by King Charles II for his glorious efforts for king and country, and given lieutenant governorship of the entire colony of Jamaica, England's richest forget colony, England's richest land that it had at the time, including all of England itself. So this tells you that the pirates of this era were not considered enemies of mankind, were not considered enemies of the nation. They were national heroes. So what happened? What changed? What went wrong? Or, depending on your point, what went right? That era known as the Golden Age of Buccaneering was from approximately the 1660s to the 1680s. By about the 1680s, the political climate changed. Why? The colonies had become very prosperous, very wealthy. And throughout the century, coming up to that point, it was a vine for power between the two major players the industry, and the buccaneers. Because both were bringing an exorbitant wealth to their various home governments. But industry had won out 
One, because a peace treaty with Spain had actually finally been respected uh, by the privateers, and they weren't bringing in as much wealth. But mostly because the economic engines had refined to such a point where the sugar trade, trade of indigo, dyes, of logwood, of tobacco, of textiles, was bringing in more, much more wealth that had eclipsed the earnings of the privateers. And now, the merchants who were three or four generations established had formed dynasties of their own with power equal to that of the aristocracy, even though this gentleman's grandfather could have been a shoemaker. So, these people who became sort of the colonial aristocracy, the colonial nouveau riche, wanted their trade to be uninterrupted. They didn't feel like they needed the protection of the privateers anymore. And in fact, they didn't. They had uh, grown to such a strength that there had been many, the numbers had increased so much that they could rally a militia to defend against any Spanish, French, or Dutch attack if we're talking the English, and likewise vice versa for all others. Um, so they felt that there was no need to have these people around. They had become more of a nuisance than they had, because they would bring the occasional Spanish incursion on their lands, and, uh, or, or a, a Dutch attack that would come into their plantations, burn the sugar crops, and really make a mess of things for them. And they didn't want that, because these Spanish or French people who were, say, coming into Jamaica, were, were doing it in retaliation for attacks that the English buccaneers and privateers had given them. So they formed a pact, a coalition, to petition the government to take the laws, much to, to make the laws much more stringent against pirates and privateers and who could do what and when, mostly to respect the peace treaties back in Europe. Now the navies of the other nations had also become much stronger at the same time. The Royal Navy of Britain, the um, Navy of France and Holland were able to better police their waters. So this, that, this generation that had once been the heroes now find themselves persona non grata, these buccaneers. So what happens? Well, they see an opportunity that the Caribbean is now closing. So they see an opportunity with the riches of the Orient, the East Indies. And they begin something called the Pirate Round. They start sailing from the West Indies and the American colonies, all the way down around the Cape of Good Hope and into the Indian Ocean to attack rich treasure fleets from uh, coming from the East Indies back to Europe with bales of silk and spices and uh, various jewels that were coming back on that trade. Now the home authorities were kind of fine with this because it didn't really concern them. They more or less turned a blind eye. Also because because the colonies were not making profit. You see, these people were sailing out of places like New York, Boston, uh, Rhode Island, Jamaica, St. Kitts. <laughs> we'll just talk for the English sailors right now. And they gained much, um, much wealth in a similar vein to the generation that had come before in the Caribbean. And the home authorities were fine with this. They supported them fully. Um, the regional governors of these colonies supported them fully again uh, because they could get a share of the treasure. The people who these, these guys were attacking, um, the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, uh, or various European nations who had sent fleets to the East Indies, were uh, of course outraged, but the European authorities didn't have much of a, much of a hand in it and didn't really care to police it because it was such a big area. Now, one of the last people who uh, really got away with this kind of thing was a man named Henry Avery. English privateer, sails down to La Coruña in Spain in 1694 with his crew. Uh, only a, a medium officer on the vessel. The crew mutinies, elects Avery as captain, and they turn full pirate. They go to the, uh, the East Indies, and in the Straits of Malacca capture the annual treasure fleet of the Mughal Emperor, who was the emperor of all of India and part of the subcontinent at the time. Um, vast amounts of treasure, 
and Avery comes back, of course wanted by England now because they have reached treaty with the Mughal Emperor and um, threatened trade between the British East India Company and the um, Aurangzeb, the man who controlled the Indian subcontinent at the time. Um, so Avery was wanted because he had gone full out pirate. Yet he came home, or well, not necessarily home, he came to the Bahamas and met with the colonial governor, Nicholas Trott, was able to buy himself a pardon in exchange for defending this very scantily protected colony, and then disappear into the night with over uh, 1, 1.2 million in today's currency, just for his own personal share. Now, this is when things really started to change, because this shook things up on a world scale. The East India Company now had their borders closed and trade was not allowed with the, um, the Indian subcontinent. So Britain took notice, and more the British um, authorities, the authorities who uh, were in charge of economics, took notice and wanted to make a difference. So they started sending out people to hunt down these rogue privateers who were not following peace treaties in the Red Sea area. Uh, this worked for a little while. And it birthed one of the most famous pirates that we know today, Captain William Kidd. William Kidd was a Scotsman, loyal to England and the British Crown, uh, and was sent out as a privateer to attack and capture pirates in the Far East. He didn't succeed. He was, uh, he was coerced into attacking um, a vessel that was a neutral and um, ended up creating a huge economic scandal. And when he returned, thinking that he had Britain on his side, the world had turned against him. The climate had officially changed. He was now the most wanted man in the world for greater reasons than just attacking a Moorish merchant ship. It was because England and the people who backed him were some of the richest people and most powerfully influential economic moguls in all of Britain, and they could not be seen as responsible for single-handedly starting a war with the Moorish Empire. So they framed the kid, they betrayed him, and uh, sent him to the gallows. This marked a very large change in the, um, this is officially marked the beginning of the Golden Age of Piracy. So luckily, what happened? A war struck, one of the biggest wars. It was called the Queen Anne's War in the colonies, also known as the War of the Spanish Succession, back home in Europe. So we come back to the Caribbean. War is on, it's great, because now the people who were buccaneers and um, who were in danger of becoming pirates could now return to their favorite trade. So they began uh, attacking um, foreign vessels again. English, England was at war with Spain and France, and Holland was on England's side, so they all united and had a great 10 year long war against each other. Um, the reason these privateers were still necessary in this was that the English Navy was battling on the home front, so they could only, and as well as the French and Spanish, so they could only afford to send very few to the Caribbean colonies to uh, defend during the war. Now what happened during that war was the people who became known as the most famous pirates in history, people like Blackbeard, Bart Roberts, Samuel Bellamy, um, all of these, these famous pirates got their origins as privateers during the War of the Spanish Succession. They were often merchant sailors or Royal Navy sailors, came from that background, uh, and then they would um, come aboard as privateers. So by the time the war ended, England, France, and Spain were pretty much bankrupt by the price of a 10 year long, almost world war. It engulfed the theater of war, main theater of war was the Caribbean and the West Indies because that was the major economic power center. But it engulfed all of Europe, part of Africa, part of India, and both North and South America in war for a decade. And the resources, the money, the manpower were spent. So at the end of this war, the English and French and Dutch governments said, thank you guys for fighting our war for us. You're, uh, you're, you're excused. We don't need you anymore. And these people were shocked because they, in past times, had been national heroes. 
they weren't given any kind of pension, they weren't given anything. Now, if you're born and raised to the sea, that's your trade. If you find your way to the merchant shipping marine or the Royal Navy, that's all you necessarily know. These people had no other way of supporting themselves than their sailing trade. So when peace was declared, and there was no more war with Spain, there was no more war between Spain, France, Holland, and Britain, it was a unique situation because these people had nowhere to look to sustain themselves, to support themselves for work. Now you say, why didn't they go to the merchant service? Of course they did. But because of the vast manpower needed for the war, there was a surplus of so many more sailors than there were to crew merchant vessels, to the point where all of the merchant service uh, in the different European nations were able to cut their wages by half to barely livable wages and um, have, you know, if somebody says, well, that's, that's rubbish, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get paid you know, a pound a year to sail with you. It's like, well, you know, that's very nice, but there are 12 men standing in line behind you who need to feed their family, and they'll gladly take the wage, so scurry off, right? So this really created a difference at the time in the world. There was no way for these men to support themselves, so many of them began to take small vessels and ply their trade again. They went to attack the Spanish at first. Because this is the grand tradition of piracy. They would attack the Spanish and be lauded as heroes. But now things were different. Even though the Spanish still didn't respect the peace treaty, the Spanish, after the peace treaty was signed in 1713, the Spanish continued attacking and harassing English shipping and French shipping and Dutch shipping to the point where um, there was huge deficit in the home authority or in, in the, the home revenues. And the colonial officials couldn't do anything about it because their hands were tied for treaties. So the common folk, who were the sailors, who were protecting the trade in the day, took up arms and they said, we're not going to let them get away with this. See, the Spanish thought that it was their right to own the new world. If they found so much as a piestra, a single Spanish silver coin, aboard an English, French, or Dutch vessel, they could say that they were pirates and or very often, they would kill the entire crew. Now, Spanish money, the piestra, the doubloon, the piece of eight, which they, uh, became known as the Spanish dollar, is where we get dollars for all of our currency today. Spanish money was the de facto currency of the New World. So any vessel found with it, most vessels would be carrying it. Actually, it would be hard to find a vessel not carrying Spanish money. So Spanish used this as an excuse to attack um, and pillage the English, French, and Dutch after peace treaties. So these former privateers would take up arms and go and attack the Spanish as reprisal. But now, what they had done for a hundred or more years and been celebrated for was now against the peace treaty. It was illegal. And the governmental authorities started cracking down on them. They then became branded as hostis humanis gratis, enemies of all mankind. And thus began the golden age of piracy, the biggest boom in piracy in the history of the world. It lasted for about 10 years, from 1713 to 1723. And at this time, there were more than 60 to 80,000 pirates in the Caribbean, French, English, Dutch, some Spanish indeed, all working together. And after, after they had been declared outlaws by their home countries, they saw no reason to continue to, um, to follow and abide by the treaty rules and indeed started attacking their own shipping. So there's a very lengthy background on the different eras of piracy in the Caribbean and what became known as the Golden Age of Piracy. Now we're going to look into a little more detail at pirates and their background. Where did they come from? Who were these people? Why did they become pirates? So, life, as a quote by Samuel Johnson goes, life at sea is as good as life in prison. Any man who has a contrivance to, uh, a cleverness and contrivance enough to get himself in jail uh, would not go to sea. Because in jail, you commonly have better lodgings, more regular food, 
uh, and better company than that at sea. And you also don't have the chance of being drowned or shot at least in your day. So life at sea in that era, it was a, it was a rough world. Disease was rampant, and disease indeed killed more than battle, accidents, or storms, or any other uh, affliction at the time. So nobody would go to sea intentionally, at least not in the Royal Navy. The Navy was brutal. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Patrick O'Brien's novel series, and uh, you've probably heard about the flogging captains, the uh, horrific for a minor offense, they would be uh, a crew would be punished, whipped within an inch of life, or um, had nails driven between their fingernails. A horrific thing. So nobody intentionally signed up for the Royal Navy, not by a long shot. So how would they get their manpower? Well, we'll use Britain as an example. So let's say you're a worker in London warehouses, in Wapping, in the East End. You're Cockney-born. And uh, you're out for dinner one night with a couple of friends in a pub. The Royal Navy squad of soldiers walks through the door, sees you as able-bodied men, lines all the able-bodied men up along the wall, marks bayonets, and say, Gents, would you like to join the Royal Navy, or shall we sputter your guts across the wall? This was entirely legal. This was the press gang, often led also by Navy sailors armed with cudgels and clubs. Uh, they would march men aboard vessels, and um, to a life at sea, men who had women and children at home who had no way of supporting themselves. So these men were Shanghai, essentially, into service and uh, given tours of duty that would last sometimes months, sometimes years. And even when they were led ashore, if they had been lucky enough to come ashore in their home port, they wouldn't get paid for their years of service until they were back on the boat and signed for another year. So naturally, Anyone in their right mind would want to escape this dire situation. Many, many did, many tried. Mm -hmm. Let's say you got to Barbados and you wanted out. You jump ship and um, swim ashore, run ashore if you were docked. But then you deserted. The punishment for desertion was death. Punis punishment for piracy was also death. They could not return to society. They could not return to their families. So what often happened was they slipped away in the night, sent away for their wives and children, and um, began a life on the high seas, sailing as pirates. Uh, now many of them would settle down in their own sort of away from prime Irish colonies, but many of them would take to a life of piracy because they could no longer return to society. And if piracy, the punishment for piracy was also death, why not make a little bit of money on the side? Now, pirates didn't just come from disgruntled sailors. There were also uh, indentured servants who, during their servitude in the colonies, in the sugar plantations, would be treated so harshly and so horribly. Because their terms would only be uh, eight, four to eight years, they would often be treated worse than the African slaves, who they would be working alongside because the African slaves were there for life. But these Irish workers, Scottish, Dutch, Flemish, Britain, uh, Brittany or Saxon, would only be there for four days. So they were, the owners of them, owners unfortunately, the, um, the masters of the plantation would try to get all of the money they could out of them and use them up. So only about 50% of people survived their indentured servitude. So naturally, with particularly tyrannical masters, many of them would want, many of the servants would want to escape. So they had very little elsewhere to go but piracy, because it was everywhere. There were people sailing the ladies, as, as we well know. Um, and the last portion would, uh, of pirate crews came from the um, enslaved populations of Native Americans and African peoples who were either very far from home or their homes had been invaded and destroyed by colonial, um, by colonialism. So these people found among the pirates something that they had never really encountered from Europeans. They found relative equality. Now this is what was unique about pirate ships of the era. Aboard a pirate vessel, all persons were equal. What does that mean? They got 
that meant that they got an equal share of 